Shalom from Jerusalem. Uh, this is a Watchman Talk, a series of conversations with security experts and practitioners. And our guest for uh, a second part of our conversation is retired general, minister, and ambassador Matan Vilnai. In our first part, uh, we have talked about uh, Matan's childhood in Jerusalem, his uh, upbringing, the uh, military boarding school he attended, and then his service in the uh, paratroops in the 1960s. Uh, and um, it culminated in his being badly wounded uh, in November of 1966 in action at Samoa, at that time um, Jordan, now under Israeli uh, control. Uh, but we will get from Jordan and Egypt and other places uh, General Vilnai uh, uh, served in or arrived at um, eventually to the cabinet uh, in Jerusalem and to the embassy in Beijing. Matan Vilnai, thank you for coming. Thank you, Amir. So uh, during the uh, uh, Six-Day War, because uh, your reconnaissance company was considered the elite unit within the paratroop brigade, which was the elite brigade of the Israeli Defense Forces. It turned out that you were in pursuit of the war, but you were always save, saved for special missions, which never came. First of all, I was wounded six months before, so I hardly walk. It was not very easy. But I walk, but very, very difficult. And uh, we got a mission to raid the headquarters of General Murtaji, who was the commander of the Egyptian forces in, in Sinai. Sinai. And because our forces moved so fast, they uh, canceled it. it where, was, was, where was the uh, El Arish? Or, or? Uh, no, in the Yalek. No, very deep in Sinai. Very deep in Sinai, near Birt Mada. But across from the Negev, from the Israeli of course, south. Of course, of course, of course. In the, in the other side, in the, deep in the other side. And you, yeah. planned, you planned your raid, you, you had it... Uh, we, we were already on the, on the helicopters to go there. One should also uh, mention that the entire brigade was supposed to jump at El Arish uh, and perhaps um, destroy an airfield and yeah, then help yeah. help the the uh, armored the troops, Corps, yeah. but the Israeli Air Force um, acted so fast, and the Israeli armor moved so fast that this was cancelled too. You, uh, I must add something, because it's all the time I'm thinking about it. What's happened in the Six Day War? How it's happened like this? Though in you, you remember that before the war, people talked about the destruction of the Third uh, Home. Of the third house, temple of the of, tem of the third temple, and uh, the mood was very low. And in a uh, few hours, it changed like this. And there are many reasons we can elaborate about it as much as you can. But the most important thing, from my point of view as a general, it's the our air force that in three hours changed the whole front, and we have. Till now, arguments between the Air Force and the ground forces. And I said to them, don't be mistaken. First of all, the skies, that or the other. When you were um, a paratroop uh, battalion commander, uh, again, a very coveted spot uh, in the army at the time, you said that maybe you made a mistake by not becoming a phantom fighter pilot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And some of her friends have been, and I, I lost a friend in the Six Day War, in the first assault. And I, I lost a friend in the same, the Yom Kippur War. He was a reserve pilot. And uh, the first one was a good friend of mine. I'm sorry, from Tel Aviv. Dan Engel. Dan Engel, yeah, really. I found his name in the defense ministry. Maybe his, his family or his mother or father served them. I found his, his name. I looked, I saw Dan Engel, you know. But, I, but the lesson is not only air, uh, but and initiative. Secondly, initiative. secondly, it's the mood of the soldiers on the ground. From the low level up. Esprit de corps. That it depends on you if the state is going 
to be saved or not. It's you, not the other one. And you feel like this. And this is very important. This is very important. So this is the, uh, the old debate between wars of necessity and wars of choice. Exactly, exactly. Then was not, there was no debate because it was obvious that you must fight, as I just said before, in order to survive. Now that you have this debate, it shows that you are in a different situation. If you have time for debate for this, so you are in a different situation. Yeah. But this also brings us to the Yom Kippur War, because the Yom Kippur War, from the Egyptian and Syrian perspective, was not fought in order to destroy Israel, but in order to return to them the territories, Sinai and Golan, they lost in 67. This was not the understanding in Israel. No, no. The, uh, the real victor of the Yom Kippur War is Sadat, personally. Because he initiated, he decided to go to it. He was prepared for this, and he achieved what he would like. He got back Sinai, and he, and he destroyed the Israelis in his front. After the uh, uh, 1973 war, in which, in which you were um, in the central command, uh, no, and then I was in the preparing for the Jordanians not to enter, and then you, you went uh, to uh, Port Said and, and uh, Port Fuad, yeah. other uh, missions which did not take place, uh, mm-hmm. as so happens. Um, your focus, uh, in a way, shifted towards farther uh, enemies, Iraq perhaps, um, leading... Uh, an airborne brigade deep into Iraq. This was quite novel for Israel at the time. No, it was uh, the thinking of a group of uh, paratrooper officers, most of them reserve officers, wonderful people, said under my command, really wonderful people. And after the war, we were shocked, first of all. I'm talking about the Yom Kippur, of course. We were shocked. We served in the level of battalion brigade commander. And uh, we decided that we need to do it the other way. At the same time... The not idea, head on and uh, the not, idea not in an built, attrition mode. Built armor divisions. We had in that time 11 armor divisions. Now we have hardly three, I believe. I'm not sure now. And we were very big, the Air Force, the Navy, everything. Too big. Maybe too big, maybe too big. And it needs to be this way. But we decided that we have to make, to do something else. And a group of uh, lieutenant colonels decided to have a capability to act with huge forces deep in the enemy uh, territory. Not, young, not uh, small forces, not raids, but something more than that. And we decided to do it. And we built, we don't believe it, we built a brigade with no authority. And at the end, we have some support from here and there. At the end, there was a brigade. Now it's one of the best brigade in the reserve because it's not a regular but a reserve brigade. And the chief of staff was not sure that the brigade is there. It was interesting. Uh, and mostly what you had to do was take anti-tank weapons with you uh, to the deserts of Iraq, the for tau, instance. The Tau, the, the American Tau, that is a wonderful, used to be, now they're better than him, of course, used to be the best uh, anti-tank uh, missile in the world. And you have to remember that in Yom Kippur, we were shocked by the Saga. The Saga was a Soviet-made anti-tank uh, missile a very primitive, and they shocked us. And in during the war, the war, in the American airlift, they brought they the brought IDF, the, the first Tau, the tau and low. Uh, and we sense. put our hands on them, and, we, and again, I said in the beginning that the most important thing is the initiative of the people on the ground. So let's go to Entebbe. Uh, June, July, 1976. You were the... Uh, July. July no, the operation okay, remember, it started in June. Remember? July the operation itself but but the uh, yeah. Air France plane was hijacked in late June. 18, and okay. and you were uh, at that time the commander of the elite paratroop brigade. No, I was the commander of the Golanite. 
I was no, then, no, no, not at Entebbe. At Entebbe. No, 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 no. With my brigade, I was in the Golan High. Okay. But you were in charge of the 35th... Uh, not in charge, the commander. The commander, of course. In charge. And no. also in charge. Some commanders are not in charge. <laughs> no, no, the commander. The commander. And you were the deputy to Dan Shomron, the... No, I was, in, I was with my brigade, the paratrooper brigade, the best brigade in the army, in the northern part of Israel, deploying, facing the Syrian army, the huge Syrian army. They have six division, armored division. We were one brigade, so it's okay. And uh, I heard in the radio that an Air France airliner have uh, kidnapped to Libya and then to Antebbe. First thing, in my office, in the Golden Heights, I went to the Atlas. There is no Google and all this. The Atlas. I opened the Atlas to find where is Antebbe. I took a measure, say, 4,000 kilometers. So it's far away. And I called Dan. He Dan, was Dan Shamron. Dan Shamron. He was then the commander of the uh, paratroopers and the infantry. I took his place after it. No, we, we, I, I was a commander later. too, later. And I told them, why you will not go and take them back home? He said to me, Matan, it's 4,000 kilometers. He said to me, okay, we have to find a way. He said to me, okay, I'll think about it. He doesn't need me. And it was Monday, Sunday, Monday. Thursday evening, he called me. Come immediately to Tel Aviv with 80, so your 80 best soldiers. So you understood what, okay. what was cooking? Okay, we don't have to talk. We don't have to talk. I ran back to Tel Aviv. I was then in, uh, in Ramat Golan. I went to Tel Aviv. I met Dan in the office of the Deputy Chief of Staff of Kuti Adam. We discussed what we can do. He showed me first, first time that I saw him tab. And we find it in an, uh, books of the air, of the pilots. They have uh, books of all the airfields in the world. Jepson. So we found it, and we start to discuss how to. And there is nothing that we can do. I said to him, maybe we'll jump with one of my battalions. We'll take over the airfield, but then what? They will kill the the officers immediately. And in the middle of the night, he said to me, Matan, Rabin would like to see what we have. The prime minister. The prime minister. We went to the prime minister. We submit to him. You have asked me now nothing. He was very smart. He was a military man. He understood everything. And he said to us, <laughs> I remember it as it happened yesterday. I know you, Red Barretts. You can show that you can do everything. This, you can't do. That's it. Out. It was one o'clock in the morning, something like that. <laughs> and we stood out of his office in Tel Aviv. We looked at each other, and Dan said to me, we can do whatever we would like in our jurisdiction. We can uh, collect the soldiers. We can train them. You can uh, make them prepare. It's in, we can do it. You don't have to wait for permission from exactly. higher authority. For As that. I talked before, we, you have to take the initiative. You must take the initiative. And we started in seven o'clock in the morning in Silken, when I was a brigade commander and where I was a cadet in the officer school and I was an instructor in the officer school. He gave the first order. The commander of Sayyid Matkal was El Barak in this case, because Yoni was busy in Sinai. And uh, no one believed that we were going to do it. So we gave the order and we started to, to train, to prepare ourselves. I gave the order to my unit, to my soldiers. I decided what to do and how to do it. And uh, at noon, Rabin called us. What's going on? He knew us very well, and he understood that we are getting prepared. We don't need his permission. And uh, 
we discuss it all over again. And what I remember is the Air Force commander. You knew him, Benny Pellet. He was really something. A very smart general, although he was from Air Force. He said to us, it's like to rob a bank. You don't have to conquer the bank. You have to go to the safe and go away. Absolutely. And that's exactly what he did. And uh, this is the story of Antebbe. All so the, so the, all, the entire difference between a great commando leader and a smart bank robber is values, <laughs> Zionism, <laughs> same character? You, the, I tell you what is the difference. The bank robber is acting for himself to get money. We act for our nation. Like it's now it's obsolete, but the sake of Israel in, in this case. But once you, you uh, uh, had your success at Entebbe in, in 59 minutes, and yeah, you found out there. that your childhood friend, Yoni Netanyahu, was dead, at one time you said it wasn't worth it. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah. I remember we slept together on the way there. In the cockpit, there is a small... Uh, rest, rest area. Bed, rest area, something not for the crew. For the crew to rotate. And Yoni and me occupied it with full gear and uh, we slept immediately. I never flew so many hours. Yoni used to fly to the States. I, I flew 50 minutes in the sun and they th threw me out of the airplane. So uh, it was my first flight of more than an hour. And uh, we slept there and we shook hands and then we... Did you have any foreboding, any, any feeling that one of you might... No, nothing. Nothing? Nothing. In order to do it, you must be like a robot. No, you, you are not thinking about it. You understand that it's very dangerous, and you understand that you must do it. That's it. Because I can tell you that in the last rehearsal, Friday night, <coughs> after we don't slept uh, Thursday night, the chief of staff, they, di they didn't believe in the operation. Motagur. Motagur. He collect the main commanders and ask each one of us to say, what is the success uh, percentage of the operation? I was very optimistic because I am optimistic in my life. I said 30% disaster, 30% uh, success, 70% disaster. How did you define disaster? The hostages being killed? I saw and Hercules crashed on the runway because the code of the operation then was Gal Efer, heap of ashes. You won't believe it. They, from the calculator. They changed it, came, it to thunderbolt. The, after that, it became a thunderbolt, but it was a heap of ashes. And that was my feeling. And all my friends, the same. And you can ask, so why you in there? In this exercise, because we decided that, that we have to do it. There's no other way to do it. But Dan Shomron did not say 30, 70. He said 26, 80. I believe so. No one believed in it. And then I realized that I have three hours to go to sleep. So I went home. And when I entered our room, my wife, Anat, is saying to me, Matan, I saw in the TV the hostages in Antebbe. What will happen? I, tell her, I said to her, no one knows. It's a diplomatic channel, something like that. We can do nothing about we, it. You couldn't confide in her? No. And then I, uh, early in the morning, I went to Antebbe to take them did back she, home. Did she ever forgive you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. I had, she had a friend that was a wife of one of, one of my officers. And they talk between, they discuss the situation and they laugh that we are going to Antebbe. I said, no, nothing, they can't go to Antebbe, it's so far away. I remember it, yeah, it's, she told me that. Yeah. Has the Israeli Defense Forces uh, lost its creativity, uh, its edge, uh, trying to, to um, outthink 
outsmart, outfox its enemies the way you did at Entebbe? I believe that at the end, the spirit, the mood of the IDF is absolutely very high. And the commander there, that I educated, they are very good. And I'm sure about them. I know them less and less because the, the gap is widened all the time. But the uh, commander that I know and the chief of staff, I visited his company as uh, a general. And I took aside his uh, brigade commander, Shmuli Karab. And I said to him, watch this officer, he will be very high. This I was is, thinking to myself, this is in the, the mid brigade command. Mid, Mid-1980s. Exactly, exactly. So he will be the brigade commander. I believe a chief of staff. And he is there, and I believe in them, and they are good. The real questions, it's about our civil leadership, and the real questions, about our society. And the society, the IDF is part of this society. This is his strength, and this is his weakness. So before we get to uh, your position now, which is head of uh, a group of retired uh, generals and uh, their counterparts in Mossad, in Shin Bet, in other uh, organizations, um, you made a detour, or we will make a detour in this conversation, uh, to politics, you refused Netanyahu's offer of uh, the defense ministry uh, after you were passed over for uh, chief of staff for for uh, because of a personal vendetta uh, by the uh, chief by the defense minister. But when that defense minister resigned, you were offered the defense ministry. You declined it, and then you served under Hud Barak as a minister. No, I served under Netanyahu as well. Uh, later, later, later as well. yes. Yeah. But, but then you went to Beijing as Israel's ambassador. What is China's position in the Israeli uh, strategic equation? It's very interesting. It's not, you have to understand Chinese in order to understand China's position. Because China, they're a friend of Israel, and they're real friends. At the same time, they never was with us in the UN, in, the, in every uh, uh, institution in the world, they are against us. So how do they, how do they express their friendship? Because they are smart. They are very smart. They understand what they can achieve from Israel. They admire, they admire our uh, capability in everything. They believe, and I have all the time to say to them, it's not right that every Israeli is very smart. And they were to say to them, and my people in the embassy said, Matan, don't say it, don't, don't say it. I said, but this is the truth. Not all the Israelis are so smart. There are many stupid Israelis as well. <laughs> and they understood that the way to technology is through the Israelis. And therefore, we are very close to them. And we work, it was wonderful to serve in China, really wonderful, smart people. First time they just start to think that maybe there is some problems in democracy. And we saw it in the last few weeks, we saw something here and there. And uh, then in China, I start to think about it. Because maybe it's not so good. And the Chinese are absolutely different for us. They understand what is the advantage of Israel, and they try to get from Israel as much as they can. At the same time, they support the Palestinians 100%. But you also know the United States, and um, when you look at this triangle of Israel, the United States, and China, what should Israel do? How should it behave between these two giants? Smartly. This is the problem. The Israeli ambassador to China, the main issue is this triangle of the three superpowers in every aspect, Israel, of course, the United States, and the People's Republic of China. And you have all the time to maneuver in this situation. And you have to understand the meaning of it. And I used to say in China, and again, my staff said to me, ambassador, don't say it. 
the main supporter of Israel is the United States of America. Because of them, we can survive. They are a cornerstone in our strategy. I was to say to them, and said, hey, don't say it, don't say it. But, but this is the truth. And the Chinese, they understand it very well. They are smart people, they understand it very well. And you have all the time to maneuver in this situation. We only have a minute or so. Um, you were in charge of homeland security of Derir as a minister, and you were in charge of uh, the southern command uh, of Gaza, uh, including during the Oslo process. Uh, you were the first to put up a fence around uh, Gaza. How can Israel survive? What should Israel do? And what do your uh, friends, does your organization, commanders, for the security of Israel suggest? The commanders, the organization that I'm heading now, the commander for the uh, security of Israel, it's 300 generals, an equivalent in the, other, in the intelligence community. We have thousands of supporters that believe that we must separate from the Palestinians, but not because of them, but because of us, in order to keep Israel a democratic, Zionist, Jewish society, we must uh, separate from the Palestinians. We started our conversation uh, in the first uh, chapter, not in this one, by talking about uh, pre-1967 Israel. In some way, you won't believe it, I miss the 50s. Jerusalem of the 50s was divided. I remember the clashes. I wasn't a kid between our soldiers and their soldiers. I was then the commander of the line, how you call it, the... The, the city the, line. The 67 line. The city, the, city line. The city line, exactly. The urban line. The, the urban line, the divided Jerusalem. And I miss it in many aspects. General Matan Bilnai, thank you for a very informative uh, couple of conversations. Thank you.